Hi, I'm Greg Howitt, and I want to welcome you to this free lesson on how to become a better church pianist. Over the next 60 minutes or so, probably more than 60 minutes, to be honest, I'm going to give you some concrete things that you can do to improve your music. By the way, if you bought this course somewhere, go ask for your money back. This is a free course. Uh, I don't know what will happen once I get it out there on the internet, but it should always be free. Now, some of you are worried because some of you know that what I do. You know that I play the piano professionally. You know that I have a lot of instructional DVDs available um, on the internet for, per for purchase. And some of you are concerned that I'm going to take the next 60 minutes and waste your time with a big infomercial trying to sell my other products. Let me assure you that's not what I'm going to do. Now, I'm going to mention products from time to time. I have to because there's only so much I can get into in an hour. And sometimes I'm going to give you um, part of what you need to know and then say to learn the rest or to go further with that, you may have to go on to something else. That'll happen a few times, but for the most part, I'm going to give you little things that you can use immediately in your music. I'm not going to waste your time. I promise you that. This is not one of those bait and switches. It's not one of those um, free seminars that you hear about and you go to and you listen to somebody um, try to sell you something for 90 minutes. This is not what that's about. You're going to get something very, very concrete and actionable out of this next, next hour. But on the other hand, let me be up front with you. My goal is not only to help you, but also to help myself. I want to introduce you to what I do and give you some... Um, a little bit of insight into my DVDs, give you an idea of the way I teach. And perhaps down the road, it might be a fit to sell you something. We're going to be talking about a particular style of music today. And I'm going to play it for you really quick. This is a song called Just As I Am. We're going to be working with this song. Now some of you know that song, but all of you know the style. It's a style of music that's called reflective, um, sometimes it's called mood music, or we could just call it soft music. And it's a style of music that church pianists need to know. We use that style a lot in church, playing under prayers perhaps. Um, sometimes we're playing while the um, congregational worship leader is uh, talking. Uh, sometimes you might play through an invitation, if y'all do those at your church. Um, sometimes you might have a communion that you play soft music under. It's a style that church pianists are called upon to do. And sadly, it's a style that most church pianists have never been taught. Here's what we've been taught. <laughs> I bet you're in that position. You know that style of music. Many of you have learned that, sometimes formally, sometimes in college, sometimes from somebody else, maybe just from listening. But you may not have been taught another style, the, the more quiet style. So when you get to the points in the service where you're asked to play softer music, you end up doing something like this. Basically, you play the same thing, you just try to play it quieter. And it doesn't work so well, does it? Well, today I want to talk to you about how you can adapt and move toward that soft, um, gentle style. Now, we're going to be working through the song just as I am, but it doesn't matter what song we work through. If you don't use that song in your church, you can certainly pick a song that you do use. The principles we talk about, are, we're going to apply to any song. Um, and I hope you will, by the way. I don't necessarily want you to be tied down to an arrangement, um, even though I'm giving you a free arrangement with this class. But I want you to have some concrete principles that you can use with any style you play. A couple of little housekeeping things before we start. First of all, make sure you do download the two um, PDF files, the two music, uh, printed music 
uh, files that are available with this DVD at greghelt.com. Look at the bottom of the screen. You can see where to do that. Um, those um, files are important. Those, those pieces of music are important because we're going to be talking about them through this class. The first one is just the basic harmony, the four-part harmony of the song. This is um, just as I am, as you would see it in the hymnal, four parts. The second is an arrangement that I wrote. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time on it. For those of you that like to critique music, you'll probably find much to critique in there. I spent maybe 20 minutes writing out that little arrangement. And I wrote it out for the specific purpose of illustrating some of the things I'm talking about today. So it's not designed to win awards. It's basically designed to serve as a big example for the concepts we're talking about um, today. But make sure you print those off. I'm going to be referring to those, those uh, pieces of music often over the course of the next hour. Now, let me tell you sort of how we're going to go through this process. I'm going to give it, in my mind at least, I'm dividing it into three different sections. The first section, I'm going to talk about some overriding principles for playing this style of music. There's three of them. And uh, these are principles that not only apply to this style, but in general, the music that you play. So we'll talk about some overriding principles. Then we're going to do some beginner, concrete things that you can use in your music. Some uh, About four things that will immediately uh, be part of your music and uh, will help you sound really, really good with this style. And then, for those of you that like more challenge, we're going to get into some advanced things, some advanced concepts. And... Um, We'll do that um, at the end of the class, and that's where I may, in some cases, tell you you need to go check out other courses because I can't cram all that into the 20 or so minutes that we'll have um, to allocate to that. Now, I hope you don't mind. I brought my coffee with me today, and uh, I don't have all the fancy cameras that I normally do. We're using one camera instead of three, um, and we're not using, I didn't bring in the production company and all those kind of things, but the quality that uh, that I use today is going to be just like the quality that you see on my uh, DVDs where I have all the cameras and all the lights that I'm not using today. All you're going to miss is a few camera angles. And uh, who wants to spend too much time looking at me? Anyway, so let's get started. We're going to start with um, some overriding principles. And um, there's three of them. As I said, we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Number one, Number one overriding principle, something that you definitely, definitely need to remember, is you have to focus on harmony. Harmony is the critical component of pretty much all music that you play um, in this style, or most styles that you would play in church for that matter. You have to know, essentially, what chords that you're playing. And you have to know which notes belong to each chord. Now, if you'll pull out the sheet with the original four parts for Just As I Am, you'll see the four parts, but you'll also see above the four parts where I've written in the chords. And uh, the way it works is if you see a chord, for example, the song starts with a C chord. Or for those of you that know, that's also a one chord. We're in the key of C, so the C chord we call the one chord. The chords are numbered based on their position within the scale. So a C would be a one chord, D would be a two chord, E would be three, F would be four, and so on. But the song starts with a one chord, and it stays on that one chord for two bars or measures. And then it switches to a G chord or a five chord. And then it goes back to a one chord. The song is very, very simple harmonically. As a matter of fact, it goes C, G, C, G, C, F, C, G, C. That's it. That's the entire song. Or if you set it in numbers, it'd be one five one five one four one five one. I want you to note, of course, that there's only three chords in this song, which is very, very typical in church music, at least in its basic form. You have a one chord, a four chord, and a five chord. C, F, and G. That's not at all abnormal for this kind of music. It's pretty simple stuff. Uh, most of you know what I'm talking about. Now, there's a few of you that don't. And uh, for those of you that don't, let me um, encourage you to take some time and learn it. Now, this is something that I'm not going to teach in this class. I'm going to assume that you know it. Um, if you want to, there is a course on my website called How to Chart a Song. It costs a whopping $9.95 if you get the download version. And uh, it's an hour long. It'll give you examples, principles that you can use 
to identify harmony in a song. You have to be able to look at a song and write in the chords, just like I did in this, this arrangement. And you have to know, not this arrangement, but this four-part harmony, and you have to know what notes belong in each chord. For example, you have to know that a C chord has a C and an E and a G in it. Um, F has F, A, and C. G has G, B, and a D. Have to know that stuff. Most of you do. For those of you that don't, um, go learn it somewhere. How to Chart a Song is the course that I mentioned. Um, by the way, if you stay around to the end, I'll tell you how you can get that course for free, at least the download version. Um, I'll talk about that at the end. But in the, um, make sure you understand the harmony. We think in terms of harmony because harmony tells you what pools of notes are available to you to play. For example, if you have a C chord, we know that we can play in either hand C's, E's, G's, and other notes as well. We'll talk about that later. But it tells us what, that's like, it tells us the restraints. What is our um, limit on what notes we can play? What notes are available to us to play at any time? And then you'll see that when we play this style, we're focused on playing those notes in various ways. I mean, if I tell you to play a C chord, you could play this, you could play that, that, you could play that. Those are all C chords. Why? Because they use the same notes, C, E, and G. All right, principle number two. Now, this is where we get a little more specific. This is where we're going to talk about some things that most of you probably have never heard of. And uh, this, is, this one sounds simple. As a matter of fact, I tried very, very hard to make all this sound simple. But it's not necessarily simple to apply to your music. It takes a little bit of work. Here's the principle. You have to spread out the notes. Spread out the notes that you play. Um, that's the layman's way of saying it. If you were going to say it from a more professional way or a technical way, you would say you want to use open voicing. Voicing is a term that refers to how far apart the notes are on the piano when you play them. Now, let me give you a quick example of that. If, you, if I told you to play a C chord, you could do this. Most of us would do this immediately. We would play C, E, and G. We'd play them close together. Okay, not bad, but it can be better. What if we did this instead? Here's the first way. Here's the second way. Which way sounds better? The second way. By an infinite margin, it sounds way, way better. The notes are spread out. We have a fifth and a sixth between the two notes. Okay? This is where I want you to go in your music. I want you to go in that direction rather than using closed voicing. Now, you might say, well, Greg, that's hard to do. I know it can be hard to do. I remember when I was told that I had to do it. I was studying, I don't know, six or eight years ago with a great pianist, John Ennis. And uh, John told me, he said, Greg, he, he was listening to my music. He said, Greg, you cram too many notes together, especially in your left hand. I was playing a lot of very, very tight chords. And he said, you need to spread it out. And um, I thought, wow, that's, that's not going to be easy to do. But the reality is, I did it because I focused on it. Um, I worked at getting better at the process of spreading out notes or making my voicing open. And uh, you can do it too as you work through it. I'm going to give you a lot of ways to make that happen. Now, let's talk about it. When you spread out the notes, what you want to do is sort of distribute the notes between your two pinkies. Remember, your pinkies are your limits. The left pinky is going to play the bass note the root of the chord normally, but that's going to be the low end of what you're playing. The right pinky is going to be the high end. Okay, so if you're playing this chord right here, let's say you have a C chord and you play a C in the left pinky and the melody note is also C. Okay, you have to put an E and a G in that chord if it's a C chord, right? Most of us do this. Okay, we end up with an E and a G, and we play a three-note chord in our right hand, and we play either a C by itself in the left hand, or we play a C octave. Okay? Very, very typical. A lot of us were taught to play a lot of octaves. Here's what I want you to do instead. Take the G, move it down here. Okay? Notice how the notes are spread out. They're spread out, distributed between the two pinkies. That's where you're going to get your best sound. You don't want the notes... Um, all congregated toward the top of the piano. You don't want them down here or in the bot toward the bottom of the piano, in the bass. 
you want to sort of spread them out. That's open, open voicing. It will greatly, greatly improve your, your sound. Now, does that mean you have to get a ruler and get it exact? Absolutely not. Um, and by the way, sometimes you'll have closer voicing. It'll just happen. But in general, it's just a good rule of thumb to try to spread out the notes when you play them. Open voicing is very, very important. All right, that's number two, but let's go back and review. Number one is you have to know the harmony that you're playing. Number two, once you know the harmony and you know what notes you have to play, you want to spread those notes out on the piano. Spread them out between the pinkies. Here's the third overriding principle. This is the one that may be the most difficult for many of you to accept. Here it is in three words. Here are the three words. Less is more. Or if I wanted to do it in two words, I could just say play less. Now that's hard for us, isn't it? There's a reason why many of us are taught from an early age that you get good when you play more notes, right? And to some extent, of course, that's true. We start playing. Looks like I still need to learn Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Single note melodies. And then we think it's a big deal when we can do. And then eventually, maybe we're doing this. Okay? And then we move on to for Elise. And then we move on to simple Bach conventions. And um, then sonatinas. And then um, eventually we move on to Bach preludes and fugues. And then Beethoven sonatas and Chopin etudes. And the farther we go through our music, the more notes we play. And in our mind, we're getting really good when we can just hammer the piano with a million notes going at once. That's how we're taught. And I'm not saying, I'm not condemning that, but I am going to say this. You don't need to play a lot of notes when you play in church. Most of us play way, way, way too many notes. I want you to play less. I want you to be efficient. Make the notes that you do play count, but play less notes. You don't have to play as much as you think you do. Watch professional musicians and see if I'm not right about that. Watch how much they actually play versus what the sound is like. It's an issue of efficiency. Now, I can't teach you everything about that. And by the way, I'm still learning these things myself. This is a lifelong study. But I will say this. So let me give you two very specific things that I want you to, to, to do. Number one, I want you to simplify the patterns you play. Okay, especially when you're playing this style. Here's what I don't want you to do. Okay, why do you need to do that when this will work just as well? the idea. You don't have to play something that sounds like a Chopin etude in your left hand. Nothing against Chopin. That's great. Just doesn't fit in this kind of music. There's a big reason why it's important to simplify. Something that you may not have thought about. It comes down to this. Most of us are not great pianists. That includes me. Most of us are not great pianists. Only the very, very finest pianist out there can choose between playing a lot of notes and communicating and there be no trade-off. In other words, no, there's only a few pianists out there that can do both, that can play enormously technical music and communicate it extremely, extremely well. The rest of us have to make a choice. A lot of us tend to lean toward playing a lot of technical music at the expense of communicating. One of the things that's very important for you to understand is that it, there are far, far, far more important things to do with your music than impress people. Way, way more important things. Don't settle for impressing people at the expense of more important things like touching people, like communicating a message in the music you play. Be very, very careful about that. That's a good reason why you should simplify your patterns. 
Beyond that, it's just the patterns sound better. They sound good when they're played simply when you're playing this laid back music. You have a lot more control of the sound. It's a lot easier to make this nice and mellow. than this nice and mellow. See what I'm saying? Um, it's a lot easier and uh, everybody can do it. Take the pressure off yourself. Play nice, simple music. I promise you, <laughs> there's a big, big demand for it. Um, the audience is out there getting a little bit tired of all the flashy stuff. They want somebody to make the piano talk to them. Focus on doing that and you'll be in great shape. Okay, so simplify your patterns. Number two, the second thing I want you to do when we're talking about playing less or the concept of less is more, is I want you to avoid doubling. Now, when I say avoid doubling, what I'm referring to is this. I want you to avoid situations where you're playing the same note within a chord in multiple places on the piano. For example, if I tell you to play a C chord, I only want you to play C one place, one, in one octave, one register on the piano, okay? I don't want you to do this. This is a C chord, but I have C in it twice. Don't do that when this would suffice, okay? Now, a lot of us have a big problem right off the bat because a lot of us have been taught to double. We're taught, as a matter of fact, to do this, okay? I have C, C, G, C, E, and G. I have three, three, uh, excuse me, C three times. I guess you could say it's tripled there. And that's very typical. Sometimes we have it quadrupled. Don't need that. Am I going to say that there's no place for that in church music? No, I wouldn't say that at all. But in this style, you don't want the octaves. Get rid of the octaves in your left hand and get rid of them in your right hand. We don't need them any, anywhere else. As a matter of fact, um, anywhere. As a matter of fact, if you look at the arrangement, just as I am, um, that I'm that hopefully you've printed out the arrangement that I did, you'll see there's not an octave in the whole song, and that's on purpose. Um, octaves are not necessarily a good sound. Anyway, they're especially not a good sound um, in this kind of music. So in the left hand, we don't want to play octaves. Now, I'm going to show you in a few minutes what to play instead of an octave. In the right hand, I don't want you to play octaves either, but sometimes it's okay if you find yourself in a position where you really want to go ahead. Of course, if you're going to play an octave, it should be the melody, right? And by the way, that's a good rule of thumb. If you're going to double any note, the only note that should be doubled normally is the melody note, okay? Sometimes the melody note and the root of the chord are the same. For example, this chord here, okay, we have a C chord, C is the melody note. If you're going to play a C with your left pinky, you got to, you're going to double the, the, uh, the, the melody note. It has to be that way. However, if you look at this chord, you see one note that's doubled. It's G, right? The G doesn't belong. Which G should you remove? Well, let's go back to the last principle. We want to distribute the notes. If we take away this G, we end up with that, which doesn't sound so good. So we want to actually leave this G and take away this G. Okay. You're thinking, how am I going to do that on the fly? That's a lot of thinking, isn't it? And you're right, it is. It's a lot of thinking up front until you do it for a while, and then it becomes like anything else. It becomes automatic. Your ear is your best tool um, for this. And once you train your ear to start listening for these things, your ear will tell you when you're wrong. It'll tell you when you're doing silly things like playing octaves. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Um, playing octaves is not always silly, um, but it's, let's just say when you're doing inferior things, when you're playing an octave and you should be playing something else, your ear will eventually start telling you those things. Um, let your ear, train your ear, rely on your ear. Your ear is, is your best tool. Now, again, the rules are you can double, but only double the melody note, okay? And often, you don't even want to do that. As a matter of fact, most of the time, you don't want to do that. But there will be a lot of times where, where it will make sense to double the melody note. And don't worry if you find yourself doing that. But just don't do this, okay? This is very typical. We have three Cs, two Gs, and one E. That is what we'd call an uneven distribution, right? Um, there's no reason to have more Cs than Gs. G is the melody note. 
the melody note is theoretically at least the most important. So if you're going to have that play more than, uh, if you're going to play any note more than other, note, other notes, it should be the melody note. Okay, those are the basic guidelines. We're going to talk about how to implement those in a, in a second. Let's review them really quick. Number one, we want to focus on the harmony. You need to know what chords are in the song and what notes belong in each chord. When you get a new song, if you don't know what the chords are, go in and write them in. If you don't know how to write them in, take the course How to Chart a Song um, and then learn. By the way, it'll take you an hour to watch it, a few weeks of practice, and you'll be good to go in this. We want to get you to the point where you can read chords in real time as you're playing. But uh, certainly as you get started, it may take you a little bit longer. Nothing wrong. No crime with just writing in the chords before you start playing. Number two, we want to spread out the notes on the piano. We want to spread them out. We don't want these kind of sounds. We want this kind of sound instead. Okay? Spread out notes. You want to distribute the notes between the two pinkies as evenly as you can. Don't crowd the notes in the left hand at the top of the right hand or the left hand. Number three, we want to simplify what you play. Less is more. We're going to do that two ways. Simplify your patterns. And number two, avoid doubling. Okay, those are the three principles. Now we're going to move in to some basic applications of how you would actually do this in real life. All right, we're ready to get started with some basic things that we can do um, to move the sound in the way you want it to go toward a nice mellow sound. These are things that I use. I'm not giving you things that I don't use. I use them all the time. As a matter of fact, this first one is something that I use constantly. And um, I'll show you that in a second. I call it an open arpeggio. It's a simple three note arpeggio that I play in the left hand constantly. And uh, it sounds really good in this style. The, um, the arpeggio is um, three notes, like I said, and if you were gonna number the notes, you'd say one, five, three. As a matter of fact, there's two formulas I need you to memorize, one, five, and three, and then three, one, and five. Now, those numbers are the notes of the, the, the notes, the numbers of the notes within the chord. For example, a C chord, C is one, E is three, G is five. So if I tell you to play one, five, three, I mean to play C and then go to G and then play E. Okay, that's one, five, three. If, I, if it was a G chord, you would play G and then D and then B. Okay? Now, why does this work? First of all, let's con contrast it to the normal way you might play an arpeggio. A lot of you, if I said play an arpeggio in the left hand, you would play this. In the song, Just As I Am, this is how it would sound. Maybe you would do, maybe play them up here. Which is fine. But these open arpeggios will sound a lot better. Here's the new way. Okay? You see, you can get through the whole song just playing those little three note arpe arpeggios and in the right hand playing a single note melody. That's all you need and you've already moved in the right direction, a huge move in the right direction. Again, the two patterns, one, five, and three, and three, one, and five. Okay, three, one, and five means you start on E, if you're playing a C chord, and then play C, and then G. Now, why would you choose one or the other? Well, you would choose to do the second one to, to sort of alternate with the first one so the music doesn't sound redundant. In this case, we're staying on a C chord for two bars. The second bar, I would change it to 315. You hear the big, big improvement there. It's just a good rule of thumb. If you're playing the same chord two times, don't play the same arpeggio. Switch back and forth between 1, 5, and 3 to 3, 1, and 5. Okay? Very, very um, good sound and an easy, easy thing you can do. Now, here's something else you can do. If you want, you can put something else at the end of the three notes. For example, you might keep the arpeggio going another note or two. Okay, so we're playing a C chord, so when we get to E, 
You could come up and play G and then C, like that, maybe. Or you might do this. What am I doing there? Well, I'm just rocking back and forth between the last two notes I played. So I'll play C, which is one, five, three, five, three, five, three. Um, sometimes you might just do this. And in that case, I'm just playing one, five, three, and then going back to five and hanging out there for a beat or two. Um, you can do that as well. Uh, I'll show you some examples of some things I could do here in a second. But here's the thing I want you to note. This actually backs up an overriding principle we talked about in the last um, session. And that is that we want to spread out the notes when we play them. If you play this, that's what we'd call closed. It's closed voicing. Even though it's not a chord like this, it's still, you're still playing closed voicing. Do this and you have open voicing. It sounds a lot, lot better. Okay? Really, really nice sound. If you pull out the arrangement that we've been going through just as I am, um, we haven't actually started going through it yet, but we're about to, you'll note that I'm using this pattern constantly through this arrangement, starting in the bar number one. You see that? Okay, and then I rock back and forth. I showed you that a second ago. So I start with the pattern, and then I put a few more things on it as well. Um, bar three, same thing. And then I come back down. Um, bar five. Let's see. And then I go up another note. Um, remember I said sometimes you tag something at the end of these arpeggios. And in that case, I just extended the arpeggio by one note. Now, by the way, you might say, well, why did you choose an A there? Why didn't you skip up to C? Well, you could skip to C. Um, but I will say this, the higher you move on the keyboard, the better arpeggios do start to sound closer. Okay, so you, can, you can't get away with doing that moving around by a third if you were right here. You couldn't move from this F to this A. But up here it sounds better. You can get away with it. And the reality is we often have to squeeze together the notes in our arpeggio as we get higher on the keyboard because there's only so much real estate before you run into your right hand. Okay, so you start, sort, of, sort of have to cram notes together as you get higher on the keyboard. But um, again, let your ear be your guide. Your ear will tell you when you're playing these arpeggios too close together. Um, in this case, you can start with one, five, three, and then go start moving by thirds or fourths or whatever. Um, keep the arpeggio moving, basically playing every note in order um, once you play that first simple pattern. Let's see. You see it again in bar nine and um, bars 12, bar 13. I, in bar 13, I play a five note arpeggio, but I start with one, five, three, okay? And so on. That's pretty much all the patterns I use through here. But um, notice I end the song with it as well. Um, again, that simple um, pattern. So this is foundational. If, I don't know, I didn't count them, but I would say that at least 40% of the time in this song, I used that pattern. Now, if you always use that pattern, obviously you got a problem. It's going to sound um, a little redundant for sure, a little predictable, um, but you can get away with it a lot. It really, really, really can be a foundation um, for where you want to go. Simple three note patterns. One, five, three, three, five, one. Remember those. All right, let's put aside the arrangement for a second and move on to the next thing that I need to talk to you about. Remember I said a little while ago that I wanted you to avoid octaves in both hands. Here's what I want you to do instead of octaves. It's very simple, really. I want you to play other intervals. Now remember, an octave is an interval. It's an eighth, what we call an eighth. I would prefer for you to play sixth, fifths, sevenths, for those of you that can, ninths and tenths, but avoid octaves or eighths. Eights. Don't play octaves. Now, 
There's a couple of reasons why that really, really works. Let's talk about a practical reason first in regards to what we talked about a few minutes ago. Remember how I said to distribute the notes between your two hands, okay? From pinky to pinky, you want to sort of evenly distribute the notes. If you're playing an octave down here, you're playing the same note, so there's no distribution. So what ends up happening is your right hand ends up doing all the work. It's got all the notes of the chord in it normally, except maybe the root. And so you end up up here with a lot of notes clumped together and just an octave, basically a single note in the left hand that's doubled. If you can play this instead, play a fifth here, let's say, now we have a note here in the left hand that we can take out of the right hand, which allows the hands to be distributed, or the notes to be distributed across hands. See that? As opposed to this, we can play this, okay? So playing an interval in the left hand not only sounds good, but it also helps solve that problem we talked about, about distributing the notes with the hands. If you play octaves, that's not gonna happen, okay? So in the left hand, what I want you to do is play intervals. Now, the intervals can be composed of any two notes that belong to the chord. If it's a C chord, you can play C and G. You could play E and C. That's a sixth. You could play G and E. That's also a sixth. For those of you that can, most of you can't, but if you can, you can play a tenth there. C and E, it's a really, really nice sound. Um, if there's a seventh in the chord, which we haven't talked about yet, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but if there's a seventh, you could play one and seven. So in the key of C, if it's a C chord, we'd probably play this, C and B. doesn't sound good right now, it will later, okay? But I'd prefer you play one and seven to one and eight, or one, the octave, in other words. Um, so be careful about that. You want to avoid octaves in the left hand. In the right hand, same thing. Don't play octaves. Play open intervals instead. Now, let's take this down to a practical level. Many of you were taught a style of church music where you would play a chord like this, okay? By the way, this piano has issues in the, in the upper end. I, I tune it regularly, uh, but it is out of tune right now. So I apologize for that um, in the upper end. But you would end up playing a chord like this. We have a C and an E, and then we double the melody note, which is G, okay? First thing I want you to do, get rid of the melody note, okay, doubling. So we get rid of the thumb, take the thumb off. Then what I want you to do is eliminate the note in between those two notes that are left. Try to move that note to the left hand, but the two notes that are left will be an open interval. In this case, it's a fifth. If you use that strategy I just gave you, you'll almost always be playing fifths and sixths in your, in your right hand, okay? And it'll really, really sound good. So, again, th those big four-note chords we don't want anymore. We want to play two-note chords. The way you do it is you remove the octave and then remove the middle note from the chord that's left, okay? Or, here's another way you could do it. When you're trying to figure out what note should I add with the melody note in the right hand to make an open octave, choose the note from the chord that's the farthest away from the melody note, going down the piano, okay? So if it's a C chord and the melody note is G, what note do you add? Well, the other two notes in a C chord are C and E. So going down the piano, the first one you come to is E, so we'll skip that one and go down to C, okay? If the melody note is E, we play G with it and skip C, okay? And if the melody note is C, we're going to play E with it, leaving out the G that would be in the middle, okay? Sounds really, really uh, much, much better, much cleaner when you take that approach, okay? Now, look at the arrangement just as I am for a second with me, and let's note all the open intervals in both hands, okay? You can see them all over the place. Again, you can look through this song a long time and not see any octaves, but you will definitely see open intervals starting in the first bar. See the two open intervals in the right hand. Um, in the second bar, you have an open interval in the left hand. It's a sixth. Um, third bar, open intervals. These are sixth in the right hand. 
Fourth bar, you have a sixth in the left hand. Fifth bar, open intervals in the right hand, fifths and sixths. And bar six, same thing, okay? In bar seven, you have an interval, it's a seventh, G to F is a seventh. Even though we're not playing the chord together, we're playing it like this, it's still an open interval, it's a seventh. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, but uh, as you go through the song, in both hands, you'll see a lot of open intervals, a lot of six. Now you'll see some more interesting chords as well. For example, in bar eight, you have this chord here. Um, that's obviously not an open interval. That's a pretty complex chord, um, which we'll talk about in, uh, in a little while. But I'm not saying every single chord, everything, every single beat you need to be playing an open interval. You can do that from time to time. It's great. Sounds great. But in general, you want to stick with fewer notes in both hands. Open intervals. Just switch out the octaves for open intervals and you'll be in great, great shape. Okay? Just an important thing, number two, basic thing that you need to use. Now, number three is the number three principle. Remember, number one was the open arpeggio pattern, one, five, three, three, five, one. Second, prince, second application was these open intervals. The third is what I call broken chords. Now, when I say this, what I'm referring to is when you play a chord, but you don't play all the notes at the same time. For example, here's a C chord. But sometimes you might do this instead. Okay? Now, that's still a C chord, but you just broke it up. You played it in two different segments of time, right? But at the end of the day, you're holding down all three notes. It's a C chord. Now, why would you do that? Well, the reason you do it, there's actually two reasons to do it. Number one, it makes you have more control over the sound. It's a lot easier to control the sound when you're playing two notes like that and then one note than trying to control playing three notes at once. If you know how hard it is sometimes to play quiet, you know what I'm referring to. Um, it's hard to concentrate and control the velocity in which you strike three notes versus two notes. And um, so that's one good reason. The second reason I really like broken chords is because it creates movement. It fills up space. You don't want to have songs that always have you ending or just resting for three or four beats on a whole note, right? But if you broke open that chord, you can fill, open, you can fill up some time by playing little patterns. Um, it could be this. Um, it could be as simple as this. As a matter of fact, the roll sort of accomplishes just the same thing. Um, but I really use this a lot to fill up dead space. Let's look at the arrangement. The best thing way to actually see this is to look at the arrangement and you'll see exactly what I'm referring to. Um, let's see, the first place it happens is in bar four. In the right hand, I need this chord. This is a diminished chord. And um, I want to get that chord, but notice what I do. I play it in three different amount segments of time. So I end up with the chord, but I play this. Okay, so there's the chord. Now, could I have done this? Um, I could, but Doing it the other way allows me to fill up a beat and a half of that bar, okay? So it helps. Now, let's go on. On bar seven, in the left hand, I want this open interval here, but I play it in two different time places, right? I'm playing them as eight, two different eighth notes. Again, fills up space, creates movement, but also gives you a nice soft sound. Notice how few notes I'm really playing, but I'm just sort of spreading them out and it feels like um, a full song. At least it feels right to me. Um, you may not like it at all, for all I know. Um, 
let's move on. You see the same sort of thing happening in bar um, 10, um, where in the left hand I'm playing. I'm playing, that's a simple one. Instead of playing this, I play this instead, okay? Um, bar 12, note that I am in the right hand, I'm playing a complex chord there, C major 7, but I play three of the notes and then I add the, set, the fourth note on the um, second beat. Again, movement, control of sound. Same thing here, I'm playing that in the left hand. Instead of playing that interval, I'm playing. Same thing in bars 19, bar 19. Why am I doing, I, I want this chord here, but I play it this way. Again, movement, control of sound. And um, I guess that's all the ones. Everything else we've already talked about, we've already seen examples of. But those are the things that you can do um, that will really, really help you in this sound. It's Again, when we talk about efficiency, um, playing uh, less notes but making them count, this is a way to make that happen. All right, one more basic improvement I want to talk about. This is a, um, a subtle one but it's one that you can do pretty much immediately. It's another little, uh, I have another little fancy way of saying it. Here it is, three words, take your time. Take your time. This kind of music wants to breathe. It wants to ebb and flow. You know, um, there's debate about this. Um, during the Romantic period of the classical era, uh, this is probably, there was more music written like this than at any other period. Um, but composers wanted music to sort of ebb and flow, and they came up with a term for it. It was called rubato, and uh, we still use that term today. Now, in the 20th century, most modern music is written on a very strict tempo, and uh, there's a term that's called end time, uh, but today's modern musicians also call this kind of music, they call it out of time, and that's not a derogatory term. Um, they just talk about playing in time or out of time. Play out of time, play rubato, it doesn't matter what, which, whatever you call it, but um, that really suits the style. Um, one of the things that it does, by the way, is it helps remove tension from the music. Sort of hard to explain that. Um, new Age music, by the way, uh, which it, to me, this is my somewhat uneducated opinion about it, but a lot of uh, New Age music seems to be all about removing tension. And one of the ways they do that is they remove the need or the feel where somebody has to play on a very, very strict um, tempo or rhythm. So you might have, in this case, you might have, if I'm counting it, it might sound like this. One and two and three. One and two and three and one and two and three and one. Slow down. Three. And then speed up. One and two and three. And one and two and three and one and two and three and one. And three. So you hear it just sort of slowing down, speeding up, just sort of tensionless, um, just sort of meandering. Um, it's like uh, living your life um, without a watch on. Um, actually, that doesn't work so well. When I stopped working as a software engineer oh, 10 years ago, I threw away my watches and I said, I'm not going to live on a watch anymore. And um, what I've found is I've never worn a watch since, um, but I still live on a, on a watch and I, because that's the person I am. I would be a much, much happier, more laid back person if I could come to the point where I just sort of, you know, enjoyed the smell or the, the uh, as you tiptoe through the meadow, enjoy the flowers and the smell, you know, as opposed to always being wondering where you're going um, and are you gonna be there on time. Those people are happy. They have less tension in their lives. They get there when they get there. Um, in terms of this kind of music, if you play it with a strict tempo, it introduces some tension into the music that doesn't necessarily have to be there. And um, I want you to, in general, play this style of music without that tension. Uh, just sort of meander around. Notice I, I called this, when I labeled this music, I called it, um, the label right here says heavy rubato, the style I want you to play it. If you play this particular arrangement, by the way, you can take this arrangement into your church and play it. I don't mind if you do that. 
I would rather you take the principles from this arrangement and come up with your own um, for any other song you have to play. But feel free to use this arrangement um, in your church as well. You can keep turning it, um, play it over and over again, um, and there's an optional ending on it as well. Um, but really, this style of music, again, you want to play it with a lot of rubato or play it so-called out of time, um, and you'll be happy um, with the result, happier with the result anyway. All right, those are the basic improvements. Now, believe it or not, what I've just given you is pretty much what you need. I've gone through the entire logic of this arrangement, except for the ending and the, the, the start and the ending and a few of the chords. Um, but if you look at the song and look what I'm doing technically, I've explained every bit of it to you. The open intervals, I've explained this pattern, the pattern that we're playing in the left hand. Um, we've talked about the broken chords. Really, in the end of the day, that's what this song is. This little arrangement is just illustrating these little things and um, little basic things that you can do too in your music. That being said though, I want to move on to some things that are more advanced. Some of you are interested in more advanced things. And uh, so I want to talk about those a little bit. And um, we obviously now, some of the stuff I'm about to talk about, I spend hours and hours and hours on um, in, in the instructional DVDs. So I'm going to give you some things. My goal is to give you some things where you can actually apply them, some nuggets, self-sustaining nuggets. In other words, I'm not going to tease you and then say, well, if you here's the first piece of the puzzle, but you have to get the second piece from the DVD. I, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you some nuggets that you can use, but then I'm going to say if you want more advanced nuggets, go to the DVD, okay? Um, so we're going to talk about some things over the next, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes, I, probably not 30 minutes, but 20 minutes um, that you can do in terms of advanced harmony. The first one is sevenths, adding sevenths to your music. Now, if you, if you read my blog, um, if you study anything I've written, you know that I talk about this a lot. Adding a seventh to a chord, a triad, is very important. All we've talked about to this point is triads, C, E, and G, three note chords. You add a whole new level of complexity and better sound when you go to a four note chord, 33% more notes. And uh, that last note, that fourth note, makes a dramatic difference um, in your sound. And if you're serious about playing the piano and learning, this is one of the things that you need to learn first. If you're playing triads, you need to start adding the sevenths to your music. Now, I'm going to show you how to do it. It's not hard. Well, it's a little bit hard to implement, but the actual thinking behind it is actually quite easy. First of all, let me just tell you about the sevenths. Number one, there's two sevenths that you could add. You could add a major seventh or a minor seventh. A major seventh is the note that's a half step down from the root. Okay, so if we have a C triad and I wanted to add a major seventh to it, I would add a B. Now, I, B is a half step down from the root. And I'm not saying that you play it a half step below the root. That changes the chord. But you play it somewhere above the root, but it is the note that's a half step below the root. Okay? So, let's say we have a C chord, just as I am. Let's start the song. Okay, if I was going to add a 7th to that chord, I would add a B. The only place I can really add a B is I'm playing it right now, is right here. Okay? Which, by the way, sounds great, doesn't it? It's a great, great sound. Um, so you add the major 7th somewhere above, somewhere between the pinkies. Normally, by the way, you can add it with your thumb. That's a place where it tends to always seem to work. I don't know why. Um, not always, but very, very often. Okay, that's the major seventh, the note that's a half step down from the root. The minor seventh, on the other hand, is the note that's a whole step down from the root. So if you were going to add a minor seventh to a C chord, you would add a B flat. Okay? B flat. So you might say, Greg, what's the difference between those two sounds? Does it really, really matter? Is it just a more of, is it taste issue? Is it a preference? Does it just create a different color um, of the chord? The truth is, it's actually extremely important to know whether to choose between the minor seventh and the major seventh. It makes a big difference. 
The seventh is very, very important because it helps define how the cord is going to behave, where it's going to want to go, um, resolve to. And uh, so you do need to know whether to add the minor seventh or the major seventh to a chord. Now, I'm not going to tell you to go to the course, but I'm going to tell you right now which seventh to add to each chord. You have to know your numbers. You have to know that, uh, for example, in the key of C, you, C is your one chord. You have to know that D is your two, E is your three, F is your four, and so on. If you know that much, here's what you do. You add the major seventh to all one and four chords. Major seventh goes with one and four chords. Minor seventh goes with everything else. Now, that is a very, very general rule, and there are exceptions, but I'm not worried about telling you right now. You'll be fine if you just do what I just told you. Add the major seventh to one and four chords, the minor seventh to all the minor chords, and the five chord and the seven chord, okay? So the one chord, you would play that. F chord, you'd play that. That's your four chord. The five chord, you'd add the minor seventh, which would be F on a G chord. Um, there are exceptions, and by the way, sometimes it will not sound good to add a seventh to a chord. That's especially true with the major seventh. The major seventh is a very dissonant sound. You have a B rubbing against a C. Very dissonant. Great sound, but very, very dissonant. And um, sometimes that just won't sound good to you. It depends on what the melody note is. Um, I could give you rules, but I don't have time um, for it. So here's what I'd say in, in, in extent, instead. Just let your ear be your guide. If the major seventh sounds good, add it. If it doesn't, don't. But in general, probably 70% of the time, I'm going to add the major seventh to my one chords and my four chords. Again, there it is without it. Here it is with it. It's a great, great sound. I love that sound. Um, so you're going to do that. The minor seventh, on the other hand, can almost always be used. Um, you can almost always get away with adding it to your chords, and you should. Now, take a minute and look at the arrangement that I wrote out for Just As I Am. Go through and look and see how many of these chords don't have sevenths on them. Um, I think there's two. Um, there's a couple of minor chords, bar 24, and there's, well, let's see... Yeah, bar 10, I think, has, doesn't have a seventh in it. Um, but those are the only two chords in this whole song that don't have a seventh, or in some cases a sixth. I won't talk about six today, uh, but a six is sort of like a seventh. Um, there's a couple of those in here, but for the most part, you're seeing sevenths everywhere, every single chord. I tend to play sevenths on every chord. Now, you may run into some people from time to time. They tend to be old-fashioned. And uh, they'll say, you shouldn't use sevenths. Or, or if you are going to use sevenths, don't use them all the time. Remember, sevenths is basically, uh, well, it's not new harmony, but it's newer harmony. Certainly, if you go back to a lot of classical music, it will be empty of sevenths. You won't find sevenths in it. And there, it's been one of those things that's sort of grown slowly um, over time. Um, it's developed, just like a lot of things have developed in music. So you'll find people that just don't believe that music should have sevenths in it. And uh, to those people, I would say hogwash. Um, sevenths sound great. You should use sevenths. And if they tell you, well, you can use a seventh, but don't overuse it. Uh, maybe use it once in a while. To those people, I would say hogwash. Sevenths sound great. Use them as much as you want. Um, your music will be better for it. Be better for all. If it works, use it. Um, don't worry too much about the traditions of men um, in regards to these things. Um, if it sounds good, use it. And this is something you definitely, definitely should use. All right, so the minor seventh on every chord except one and four, add them. How do you add them? Well, you fit them in. Again, let's say we have a C chord. If you need to add the minor seventh, very, very often you can put it in here with your thumb. Those both work. Those voicings both work. Notice how the notes are sort of spread out. Um, 
Not perfectly spread out, but they're spread out. It's an open voicing. Um, and so on. Now, um, play the sevenths with your thumb, but sometimes you won't be able to play it with your thumb, and in those cases, just put it in where it sounds good. Let your ear, let your ear be your guide. Um, I could say that a lot um, when you're talking about music. Let your ear be your guide. All right, so those are sevenths. Make sure you're starting to do that in your music. Let's move on to the next advanced topic. The next advanced topic is chord substitutions, the topic that everybody wants to know about. Now, let me just say this about chord substitutions. My personal opinion is the whole term chord substitution is a flawed term. Really, what we should be talking about is a bigger, broader issue called reharmonization, which means basically changing out harmony for other harmony. The reality is, if you give me a set of chords, there are a numerous, there's an infinite, almost infinite number of other chord progressions that would substitute for that progression. Um, really, when I'm thinking about reharmoni reharmonization or changing out chords, I'm thinking about reharmonizing a lot of chords or a string of chords rather than just one chord. That's the better way to think about it. Um, and the reality is, if you look at it chord by chord, there's almost any number of chords that would substitute for any particular chord. There's a universal rule of chord substitutions that I often say. First of all, any chord can substitute for any chord if the new chord works with the melody note and it works with the chords around it. That's true. However, there are some chord substitutions that seem to work a lot, and um, I can teach them to you in about five or six minutes. And so I'm going to, and uh, we'll see them in action. And uh, there, this is only touching the tip of the iceberg, I promise you. But these are things that you can use right away and incorporate in your music, and your music will sound better. Here they are. Remember, to this point, we've talked about essentially three chords, one, four, and five. Most songs in your hymnal are going to be comprised of those three chords, with maybe an additional one here and there. So let me tell you what you can substitute for each of those chords. Make sure you get this. The one chord. You can often substitute either a three, which is a minor three. By the way, you always add the seventh to these chords. A minor three seven for a one chord or a minor six seven for the one chord. Three or six will substitute for one. The four chord. You can substitute two, minor two, seven, or six, minor six, seven. Minor six, seven will also work. The five chord, minor two, five, seven, minor two, seven, or the seven chord, which is a half diminished chord, which I don't have time to talk about, but the seven chord will also substitute for the five. Two or five. By the way, I'm saying two distinctly on purpose. It's not the three chord, it's the two chord. The two chord substitutes very nicely for the five chord, and so does the seven, okay? Three or six for one, six or two for four, seven or two for the five chord. Now, I've got some examples of that in Just As I Am, so let's look at them. The song actually starts on bar number um, seven, eight, nine, bar number nine. See that? Now, the original harmony calls for two bars in a row of a one chord. Okay, so it sounds like this. Hear that? C chord on both bars. Let's change it. Let's change it up. Now, we're going to leave the first bar alone. We're going to leave a C chord on the first bar. The second bar, let's try a three chord instead. Great sound, huh? It sounds really, really nice. Let's try the six. I like that as well. Now, which one would you choose? Whatever your ear tells you, whatever your preference is, both of them will work, okay? What if you tried both of them? What if we took that bar and we said, I'm going to put a three chord on the first half of it and a six chord on the second half? By the way, that's within the rules. Um, you don't have to substitute a chord for the entire amount of time that the other chord is there. In other words, if you have, let's say, a bar of a C chord, you could substitute the first two beats of that bar. You could substitute a chord, substitute a chord for the last two beats of that bar. 
That's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to use a three chord and a six chord. Okay, so we're going to start with one. One, three, six. Okay, hear that? So I substitute all, I used three chords in those two bars. One, three, and six. Okay, let's keep going. Now I'm supposed to go to a five chord here, but what if I went to two instead? And then I went to five. Okay, so I substituted a two chord for the first part of the amount of time that that five chord was being played, okay? Let me go back to my original music. Um, the five chord is actually a bar long. So I substituted a two chord for the first two beats and then I moved to a G chord and the five chord for the last beat, okay? Two, five, one. Okay, now I'm supposed to go to the five chord. Let's go to the two chord instead. Now we'll go to the five. One. I'm supposed to go to the four chord here, which let's do it. Instead of staying on it though, let's substitute the two chord. So I changed the four chord into four, two. I'm supposed to go to one, let's go to three instead. And then six. Supposed to go to five, let's go to two instead. Okay, so those are some substitutions that I did just with that song. They're not the only ones you can come up with your own. Um, I used a slightly different, um, in the arrangement, I used a slightly different formula. And by the way, in the arrangement, I also threw in some substitutions that are outside of the scope of this class. For example, this sound right here. We didn't talk about this substitution right here. Okay. I didn't, we don't have time to talk about it today, but that one is one that you can use as well. Um, it's a few things going on in this song that I just don't have time to talk about, but you will see me using um, those minor chord substitutions that I just gave you. For example, look at bar, should be bar 10. Yeah, bar 10. Um, Notice we have E minor moving to A minor. Originally, that was a C chord. So we substituted a three chord for the first beat, and then you see we substituted a six chord for the last two beats, okay? So that works well. The next bar, which is bar 11, was supposed to be G7, which is your five chord, and I've substituted D minor seven, which is your minor two seven, okay? So there you have it, that's your, um, your chord, minor chord substitutions, I call them minor chord substitutions because you're substituting a minor chord for a major chord. Um, and um, if you're thinking in terms of triads, you have minor triads and major triads, we're substituting a minor chord for a major chord. Okay, now we have one more topic that I want to go over for a few minutes that's also in this song. And um, it has to do with the concept of color notes. Um, color notes are notes that we add to chords in addition to one, three, five, and seven that give the, the chords that you play a little more pop. For example, we could play a G7 like this, which is fine, but we could also do this. There's an additional note that I added. I added an A to that chord. Now you might think, Greg, why did you add an A to that chord? Why does it have an A in it? Does an A belong in a G chord? Well, not the way you think about it normally. You think G, B, and D, and F, if you add the seventh. But A is actually the ninth of that chord. And if you add the seventh to a chord, all of a sudden you have all these extra notes available to you to add to the chord as well. And um, you should. These notes sound really, really, really good. So that would be one. What if we added this note? That's a slightly different sound. I'm adding an E, E natural to that chord, which again, doesn't belong. We call it a 13. 
It doesn't belong to the original triad, but it's the thirteenth of that chord. We could do something like this. We've added an A flat to that chord, which is a flat nine. We could even do this. Flat nine, flat thirteen. These are all things that sound really good. Let me show you a few examples through the song. The first one occurs on bar number eight. Okay, so we got. Okay, that's that example I just showed you. That A flat is a flat nine. E is your natural, is your natural 13. Okay. Don't worry, this is confusing. I'm going to give you some tips in a second to make it easier. Let's see, in bar, let's see, is it 13, 14, 15, bar 15. You see G7 altered. Altered means it's got flat nines, flat thirteens in it. Here's how it sounds. chord right there has an A flat in it. That's a flat nine. That's one of my favorite sounds in the world. That right there is a um, C7 with a flat nine, a D flat in it. A minor with a B in it. Okay. The B is your ninth of that chord. That sound right there, flat 9 and 13. Now, some of you are thinking, what's the big deal? Well, you've been with me now for over an hour, and um, I assume that part of the reason you've stuck with me is because you either like the way I play or you like the information I'm giving. If you like the way I play, these color notes are a big part of how I get my sound. Um, I add them constantly, um, and they're very important. So this is a topic that's worthy of your attention. Now, there's two ways you can learn about extended chords. I'm going to give them to you really quick. By the way, that's what we're talking about, extended chords, chords that go beyond just one, three, five, and 7. Two things you can do. Number one, you can take my course on reharmonization and I give you a very systematic approach to learning um, these color notes. Flat nines, nines, sharp nines, eleven, sharp elevens, flat thirteenths, and thirteenths. And you'll learn which color notes belong with each chord and when you do one versus another and so on. But here is a simpler way. This is something that you can do without buying anything. All you do is this. You pick up a song, you write in the harmony, and then as you play through the song, you force yourself to stop on every chord and look for a note that you can add to the chord that sounds good. Okay? You don't even have to worry about whether it's a 13 or a flat 13 or whatever. Long term, you'll want to learn that, but right now, just try to come up with some sounds. In other words, teach your ear how to look and hear sounds that, that, are, that sound good, but you're not used to hearing. You have to force yourself. Uh, force yourself to get out there and start looking for those unusual sounds. And as you use them over time, they'll become part of your vocabulary. And uh, you'll start using them uh, instinctively. That's the way I learned um, to play these kind of, of notes. As a matter of fact, I knew um, nothing about the technical aspects of extended chords for years um, after I started playing them. Um, so you certainly can. Um, I remember taking, as a matter of fact, it was John Ennis. I went in and I showed him something I was playing. And I said, what is this? I didn't know how to label the chord. And um, he told me what it was, but I didn't know. But I was already playing it. And you can do that as well. So don't feel like you have to become a theory expert um, to use these kind of things. All right, so that wraps extended chords, and it really wraps the advanced section, which means we're wrapping up this course. Again, the advanced section, we talked about seventh chords. We talked about um, uh, the substitutions, chord substitutions, and we talked about um, extended chords. And that pretty much wraps up what, we were, uh, what I wanted to cover uh, for the course. So let's go through everything really quick. We talked about overriding principles. Overriding principles, you have to know your harmony. 
then you have to um, spread out the notes, spread them out, and then play less. Avoid doubling, simplify your patterns. In the basic section, we talked about the open arpeggios in the left hand, open intervals in both hands. We talked about broken chords in both hands, spreading out the notes when you play them so you can control the sound and fill up dead space. And we talked about rubato, taking your time. And uh, then we just covered those topics in the advanced course. I hope you learned a lot. I hope these are things that you can feel um, ready to go in your own music with some practice. A lot of these things you should be able to do practically immediately um, with just a minimum amount of work. Um, and some of them will take some work. Let me briefly tell you a couple things. I promised you at the beginning, I said, if you will um, uh, do something for me, I will give you that download, a free download of how to chart a song. Free. Um, won't cost you anything. You can download it just like this, um, this course and watch it for free. And it really, really is sort of foundational to set up not only this course, but pretty much everything I teach, everything comes back to understanding what are, am I playing harmonically. Here's how you do it. All I need you to do is this. I want you to send this note, send this course along to a decision maker. Um, somebody you know, maybe the, the, um, your piano teacher. Send them a note, tell them what you thought about it, and tell them to check it out. Maybe the music director of your church, maybe another pianist of the church. Do that. Copy me on the email. My email address is greg at greghallett.com. Uh, greg, G-R-E-G, -E at greghallett.com. My last name is spelled H-O-W-L-E-T-T. -T. You see it on the screen in front of you. Um, but um, copy me on the email and, um, and send it on to them, and I will send you a link um, to download how to chart a song for free. Um, let me tell you briefly about other courses available on the site. Um, another foundational course is Theory for Church Pianists. Five hours of theory that church pianists need to understand that sets up everything I teach. Um, it's not overwhelming. Like I said, it's five hours. We teach only what you need to know. Things that you don't need to know about theory, we're not going to teach. Now, that sounds pretty simple, but the reality is if you get bogged down in a lot of theory courses on college campuses, you're learning things you'll never use. And uh, they're historical artifacts or whatever. We're not going to cover those in this course. I'm going to give you a finite, limited set of information that you really, really need. We have a course on arranging, how to arrange your own offertories. A course on congregational accompaniment, that big stride sound that a lot of you um, play uh, for in your church when the congregation is singing, the big <laughs> that sound. Oh, there's a course in there on reharmonization, which I've been referencing, that teaches you everything I just covered in the advanced section but in four hours. So it's, there's a lot of detail, and we walk through a lot of very, very advanced things, way, way, way beyond the scope of what we just covered. Of course, on how to play by ear, every piano should. Modulations, how to move between keys. There's a course on how to play lead sheets, um, how to play soft music that's somewhat similar, not really similar to this course, but there's a little overlap, but for the most part, it's sort of a standalone course. It's not really like what I just covered. Um, you'll see if you take it. And then a couple other courses, how to accompany small groups and um, how to transpose. Um, nobody likes to do it, but we all have to from time to time. So I hope you'll uh, check those out. Again, I'm Greg Hallett. Thanks so much for sticking with me. Drop me an email and let me know what you thought about this course.